with, um, and I think it's going to be a really great show. Um, you're all here tonight for Popular versus Brilliant, um, the talk prepared by Jim Bowles. And so I'm going to go ahead and welcome him to the stage now and turn it over for a really exciting talk. I've got to do some plugging in. Sure. Talk about it? Sure. We're going to broadcast this on Periscope as well, so you can look me up on, on the account. Let's just see if this is working. Is it right? Is it squished? No. Good. Right, I'm going to start broadcasting. Huh? No, no audio. I know, we're moving brands. I've got no films and no audio. It's like a first. It's going to be brilliant. Right, I'm broadcasting. Think. One second. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Great. Um, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's nice to have such a big crowd. Uh, it's, uh, it's a brilliant um, thing if, and uh, just really glad to be here. I should cure some things up though to start with. Firstly, my clicker's not working. So, so here's the social stuff. If you want to um, do any tweets or if you want to put stuff on Instagram, um, I've got my own uh, you know, name there, there's the moving brands. I'd have my own hashtag I use called Jim Speaks, which is where I put opinions out in the world. And there's the designers and geeks one there as well. So any time you want to do any of that tonight, that's all good. So the first thing to do. The next thing I should explain is that I'm British. <laughs> and that means I speak too fast. I speak very, very fast uh, a lot of the time, particularly when I get excited. So anytime I'm doing that, raise a hand and I'll know that it's to slow down. If I'm not sure it's asking me to slow down, I'll ask you, and you can tell me it's to slow down, and that's the way that we'll work it. I also have a British accent, which means a lot of the words that I use, um, I kind of say them a bit wrong, and I also use words that maybe you guys don't use, like these. I'll read them out in a British accent, because it's quite fun. Blimey, bloody, tosser, bugger, bollocks, bell end. Knob end. Do you all know what that is? Pillock, plonker, pisser, shite, and wanker. They're all British words that you should all learn. But fortunately, I'm not going to use any of those tonight because they're all rude and it would be totally inappropriate to use them. Also, I get asked all the time, do you live in Britain? Are you here sometimes? What's going on? Where are you from? And all that. I live in San Francisco. I'm one week a month in New York. And I'm often in Los Angeles these days as well, which is quite fun. And I'm hardly ever in London, hardly ever in the UK, maybe once a year. So I'm here in San Francisco. So if you want to talk to me or you want me to do other things or whatever it is, I'm here. I'm easily accessible. Um, just come ask. And I grew up in a weird place called the Isle of Wight, which is an island off the coast of the UK. And it's really famous for the Isle of Wight Festival, which is like the UK's Woodstock. It's also really famous for, it's, it's big in the Cretaceous period, so there's things like the Iguanodon that was discovered there and lots and lots of dinosaurs and fossils. We've got a really big surf culture, as you can see. Uh, actually, the European Surf Championships are sometimes held there. It's also a place that's got a ton of weed because most of the weed comes into that island and then goes off that island and gets dispersed around the rest of the country. So it's basically like a mini California, so I feel really at home here. Um, <laughs> You know, it's pretty much, pretty much the same thing. But I studied in a place called Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design, which still exists, but it's part of the University, University of Arts in London. Um, you might not know that. In the UK, it's a real big deal. It's like a really great college. Um, and it's got some amazing alumni. Um, this dress is designed by Alexander McQueen. So he went there. Do you know who he is? Look him up. He's brilliant. These guys are called Gilbert and George. Big, uh, famous artists in the sort of late 50s, 60s, that whole kind of period. Still going today, amazing artists. This is Anthony Gormley, another great artist. He did the uh, uh, Angel of the North, it's called, uh, which is a big um, sculpture. And then this girl is called MIA. Do you know her? Lots of people don't. She's really famous for giving America the finger during the Super Bowl. So she's there. But she was actually in the year younger than me, year after me at, on the same course, graphic design. So it's a very broad sort of 
design course where a lot of artists and musicians and different kinds of people come out of it because it's very broad and it's got this very sort of um, can-do, broad attitude to what it's about. I tell you that because in 1998, when I graduated from college, which seems like a long time ago now, probably because it is a long time ago, I started it with five friends. So, so that's the five of us there. Actually, it's only four of us. I'm there. The fifth guy's taking the picture. Um, and now that's grown to like about 100 people. Um, and, but we talk about our, everyone as being friends of the business, you know, um, collaborators in the business. Uh, so that's the way we like to think about it. And we've got studios in San Francisco, New York, Zurich, and London, just in case you were wondering. And this is the kind of work we do. I heard you say that I'm going to talk about the work, but I'm not actually. I'm just going to show you this one slide and say, Move Around does tons of work. We do a lot of strategy for clients. We do a lot of brand for clients, including logo and how that all comes to life. We do a lot of product design for clients, both physical and digital. Uh, we do a lot of physical space type work and everything kind of in between. So we're kind of a one-stop shop for a ton of stuff. And our clients tend to work with us for a long time and do multiple, multiple engagements, multiple work streams, multiple kinds of things to get stuff going. Um, and some of those things are new. Some of those things I haven't told people we've done before. You know, there's some interesting logos on there. Anyway, popular versus brilliant, which I think is what you want to uh, hear about. So that's enough about moving brands and me. Am I talking too fast? Good. Popular versus brilliant. So we were talking about this in the studio, and we kept talking about it. And then there was this massive email chain that went around kind of about this stuff about good design that works versus really brilliant creativity and what's the difference between those things and I'm starting to feel like there's a real sheepism or design sheepism that's kind of happened and it's built basically over the last 15 years I felt like getting stronger and stronger and stronger a thing and I'm not sure that is does it do, do you even think I don't know I'll keep talking so this for example I'm not picking these specifically to prove a point these were just the first four I thought of I went to this you know car on demand type way of thinking. I thought, OK, who are the four ones that spring to my mind? Let's look at the websites. There's some slight differences here, but they're very slight. And I love a lot of these brands, and I think they're all good design. You know, there's good stuff going on here. But it's weird how homogenous that is. I find it really strange that businesses that their difference, their uniqueness, what's good about them. You know, everything that's unique about that business is really important. But when it comes to the way it actually rolls out, it feels the same. You know, every single startup I kind of see kind of looks the same. There's a sheepism to what good design is. And I'm trying to work out where, that, where that's come from and what that is and whether anybody else agrees with me. I'm still not entirely sure where I am on the fence, but I'm somewhere in this, and I think it's definitely a thing that's happening. It might be a thing that's happening because of age and the amount of different iterations in design style that I've seen over the years. But here's another one where I was sort of thinking about, oh yeah, Internet of Things, you know, like wireless locks, wireless thermostats, uh, how all this stuff sort of links up. And all these brands are brilliant, and they've all got great products. And they've all put a shitload of work into their brand and their design and all these things. And it's all really good. But they all look exactly the same. I just find that it's like almost incredible. Like uh, you could cover any of these logos up, swap the products around, and I don't think anyone would notice. I mean, it's not perfectly the same, but there's a lot of sameism happening here. Same here. I use all of these all the time. These are two different websites. I mean, that's just. <laughs> Uh, this is this is Munchery, this is Caviar, this is Sprig, this is Spoon Rocket. All good. I'm not saying none of this is, isn't good design, but what I am saying is, what's the point of them all being exactly the same? They've all got straight down photography of food. They've all got you know brand along the top. They've all got I love this like zip code button, zip code button, zip code button, zip code button. It's like, it's great. And then one color that's ownable. Although these have both gone for a little orange thing so and the, oh this one's orange green so that's maybe a bit healthier but the thing is <coughs> it's weird that it's all really similar you know and I think there's this sort of like I love it all and I get excited about all of this stuff like you do but I also see this sort of like endless grayness kind of spreading out in front of me where all these all these businesses are emerging and they're worth billions of dollars but they all look exactly the same and I'm wondering where the 
the, the creative hierarchy is in the way that that all fits together. So I'm starting to see it like a big sort of endless sea of sameness. But it's not always been that way. You all know this brand, right? You know, because of Benetton. The older people in the audience will know what I'm about to show. The younger people might not, but they used to, they make t-shirts and, you know, clothes and all that kind of stuff. But they used to go to market with campaigns that look like this. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> but it stops me in my tracks. It grabs my attention. It makes me think for a second. It makes me feel something for a second. It makes me go, hate that, like that. It causes me to have emotions. And I think that's what great creativity, brilliance, does to you. It's kind of an artistic value to design. That's the way I see it. And they just kept doing this. This is a really famous um, photograph of a, a guy suffering with AIDS, and he was dying, and this was snapped, and they used it as part of their campaign. So it's quite challenging, and they're being sort of um, pokey on purpose to get you to like think a thing. But I think this is much more valuable in the world, much more interesting in the world, than an endless sort of grayness of everything being the same. Again, just more examples of the kinds of things that they were doing with human hearts and like you know, questions about race and whether that matters and all, all these kind of things. And obviously they're called United Colors of Benetton, so they always sort of played on all of that kind of stuff. And then I really like this one because it's sort of way less challenging in one way, but other people get really riled up about this one, but they're not worried about another one. But I just find this like endlessly interesting but by 2011, United Colors of Benetton looked like this. This looks like everything else. Their last campaign at the end of 2015, their autumn and winter, looked like this. What the hell's happened to United Colors of Benetton? Are they sort of being homogenized in the same way that everyone else is? What, what's going on? I'm, I'm really interested. I don't know the answer. I'm just raising the question, so maybe we can have a debate about it. But this just is crazy to me. So how, do you go, how does a business go from this to this? I mean, this was probably a decade and a half ago, maybe even two decades ago. So it's a long time ago. But this is way more progressive than this. And we talk about how we're making new technologies, and we talk about how we're defining new markets and disrupting markets and all this kind of stuff. But I think design, we're getting more skilled at. But I think the creative intention, the creative thought, the story behind the things we're creating is just collapsing. There's nothing to it. It's see-through. It's veneer. So how do, we, how do we deal with that? Some reasons that that might be happening, one I've thought about is the rise of design. Apple, wonderful business, built all of our careers, you could argue, because they put design at the front of everything they did, and they told the world of business that it was important, and they did it their own way, and they made design a valuable thing. I remember being taught back in 1997 when I was at Central St. Martins that I was getting taught skills that at some point in the future would be valuable because the world didn't understand what they were really used for yet. And I think that's true. But now Apple started it, Google followed, lots of other businesses do the same thing, and it became big business. You know, having design at the forefront of your business can create more value more um, connection with customers, all of those things. So business finally feels like it designs, it, it understands what design is and the power of that design. The problem with that is it's become a very popular thing. 15 years ago, you say you're a graphic designer to someone, they, you know, the taxi driver, he wouldn't really know what you're talking about. Now he knows exactly what you're talking about. It's like front of mind. It used to be something kind of in the mists. Or, and the other, kind of thing I've been thinking about, is it this kind of endless Californiaization? I don't know if I'm saying that right, of everything, which is kind of a, a fun thing to think about it, but a lot of these big businesses are Californian. There's a kind of look to that, which you can see in the likes of Uber and Muntry and all of those brands. There's a particular vibe to the photography, a particular vibe to the whole thing. The tone of voice is very kind of relaxed, but credible and all that kind of stuff. And there used to be a time when brands were really different. Shell used to be really different to a fashion brand, and a fashion brand used to be really different to a technology brand, and a technology brand used to be, but they all feel like they're kind of more similar than ever. So is there a thing called California design? Just an idea, maybe something to think about, and what, what are the traits within that? I think maybe there is. I mean, you look at the movie world, most movies look uh, a great way because most of them are filmed at one time in Hollywood because it had great light, because it had great light, most movies would have the same kind of dynamic to them. So I think there might be something about the light, the temperature, 
the vibe that kind of feeds all of that. But I haven't baked that idea enough yet. Maybe you could help me bake it. The other one is design education. Maybe there's something happening there. I mean, I think design education should be about experimentation and play and breaking things and being allowed to fail and question things and push it and pull it and pull it and be ideas-based and conceptual and dealing with the impossible and the implausible and fill you with self-belief. And I was taught that the things we should be referencing as designers was arts and culture and things that are happening in the world. So it's kind of like installing an attitude in you that was about, fuck it, let's make new stuff. That's the way I graduated. That's how I felt when I graduated. But I, I, I don't know for sure, maybe some of you that have graduated more recently can tell me, but it feels to me when I talk to people that are recent grads that it's a bit more, they're very respectful of, that of, pe of people that have done it before. I wasn't respectful of anyone when I graduated. I just wanted to get on with stuff. But people are very respectful, quite happy to emulate and repeat things, very skills-based, um, very about the details, very about being perfect, very about being precise, very about the tools, very about an iterative process so we can work out the correct way to do it. And, but I think that also builds in a little bit of self-doubt in your own creativity because you're relying on all of those tools and, and all of that stuff. And one thing I've noticed is the reference of design now to generate design ideas. And looking at businesses as the best pinnacle things in the world. They're not. <laughs> They're things that make money and you know, do great stuff, but art's a pinnacle thing. Poetry is a pinnacle thing. Music is a pinnacle thing. Those things seem like back burner to making a brilliant device that's going to change the world. That's, I, we've, I think we've got that really round the wrong way. And the more we use design to influence design, the more we're aspiring to create these things, it's going to be more and more homogenized as we go forward. It'll just continue to happen. So I think there's more of an attitude which is like, I love that. Like it's a real, it's, it's passionate and it's desire. I love that. I'm going to make something like that. I'm going to make something that's as good as that. Whereas I think that's a different attitude to, fuck it, I'm going to make some new stuff. That might not be right, though. It's just a hunch. <coughs> the other thing is, and the UI, UX people and, you know, the, the geekier side of the designers here might, might be thinking this in the back of your mind as I'm talking that one of the reasons stuff kind of looks the same is this idea of we're entering a point where we've perfected the screen. So in a world where we used to click and now we touch, we know where to put things and how big they need to be for the size of the finger and where I'm going to draw the eye and where I'm more likely to click something top right than bottom left, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that denotes that sort of means that we're making things. But I was thinking about that the other day. It's like, that's all cool, but I see all of that as like, it's equivalent to designing brochures. You know, I, I think it's really important stuff, and I love all that stuff, but it's not what I aspire to do. I'm, I'm not a brochure maker. I want to make kind of important, lovely, beautiful things. But I think there's definitely something in this. You know, one of the reasons certain colors are used all the time, certain typefaces are used all the time, certain places on the screen are used for the same kinds of... Uh, territory or whatever your content uh, is, is all to do with this stuff. But I still think there's room in this to challenge, you know. I don't understand why that means all the photography has to be the same. I don't understand necessarily why you can't be a bit more bold with your choice of typeface to try and say something a bit more unique about your business. It just seems like it's like this um, pacifying thing that's happening. But I think things are looking up because if that's the case, and it's the fact that we've uh, perfected the rectangle, I think then death of the rectangle is on its way. So there's stuff like this from, you know this company, Magic Leap? It's cool, they've got like billions of dollars of backing. It's an amazing business. And they've just put out these kind of images and they're sort of promising this sort of augmented world. And people are either into VR or they're not into VR or they're a bit kind of dubious about it or whatever. But I think there's a, there will become a point where screens aren't as valuable as they are right now, for sure. It'll kind of disappear. And if it disappears, what does that mean for us as designers, as creatives that create that stuff, as people that perfected the screen? What the hell are we going to do next when screens kind of disappear? So I've been thinking about this and kind of like, this is a bit sort of conceptual, but like you can imagine a time where actually the packaging of an object doesn't matter as much because more of it will be augmented 
more of it will be connected to the internet of things. So you'll be called to it and pick it up and all those things. And it'll be kind of like the visuality of that object might be way less important in the real world. In this augmented world that you can choose to be in or not, that's where all the stuff will happen. Billboards might completely go, finally. There's really interesting, I love this image because it's talking about how big this building is, the fact that there's a pothole, how far away this car is, no parking space here, how many meters, this is an entrance to a building. At some point, we're going to have all this information and we're going to have to sort out a new way of dealing with it all and a new way of like designing that. This is another Magic Leap um, image. I wanted to make the point here that it was about what happens when devices go, because if screens go, you know, these things that we have in our pockets will be less needed. And therefore, what are the, the new objects that we'll be interacting with? Nike trainers without logos, really interesting, I think. It makes you concentrate on the form factor a bit more to denote what it is, rather than the branding doing that job. And then what will experiences be like? This is another, I think it's another magic uh, leap uh, image. But I like the idea that you could go to the theater or you could experience a concert or any of these things in a completely new way at any time in any space. And what does that mean for us as designers? So all of that feels like there's a new place that we need to get to. You know, I think our jobs in the next three to five to seven years is going to be to create a new design vernacular in a world without rectangles or a world that's trying to create more products and services and experiences without the, the confines of the rectangle. So that sea of grayness kind of comes full circle and becomes a sea of opportunity that it might just be that we've saturated that object and we've got to wait for new technologies to come along before we uh, change those about. And that's about all I wanted to say. Have I been way too quick? How long have I got left? Huh? All right, good. Well, good. Questions? <laughs> Anyone got any thoughts on that? How much longer have I got, actually? Oh, wow, cool. Anyone got any questions or things that we could talk about? I'm quite interested to know if anyone, like, staunchly disagrees or staunchly agrees or thinks something off the back of that or has felt some similar things. Uh, so I have a question uh, playing off of your idea, the hypothesis of uh, design being self-referential, where you design informs more design. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether the um, massive amount of information that's available on the Internet accelerates that further or slows it down. Because in one way you could imagine that there's more diversity of visual ideas because there's so much stuff flying around on the Internet. And on the other hand, you could say that's a much faster way to spread the one right answer to everybody, so there's more gravitational pull to one set of constraints. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, it's kind of, there's quite a few different things in there. I mean, of course, the internet's full of all kinds of content, um, and all of those things are much, easily, uh, much more easily and quickly shared, and we all get to see them much, much quicker. But I, I think what I was talking about is more this rise of looking at design by designers to influence design. So it's not, I don't think we're looking at all of that wonderful content a lot of the time. I think, I've even experienced it in our own studio where, you know, you're, you're doing a big board of things you're going to influ be influenced by. You know, we call them the mood boards or the territory boards and like, what are all the references? And it's sometimes been littered with the same design things that keep coming up from project to project to project to project. And so, we, you know, it's just like looking at that, it's like, well, if they're always the references, we're always going to draw things that look like those things. So we then went on a journey of looking at like rune stones and totem poles and fine art and music and getting back into all kinds of different stuff. And the results were just like Im immeasurably different, immeasurably different to the way you approach the creative. So I, I don't know if it's the amount. I just think it's the places we go to to get our influences. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, maybe other people don't do it the same way, but I think if we're honest with ourselves, we, we reference good design too often, and I think it limits the possibilities of the project. It limits the kind of, especially if it's something you're referencing that's good and did well and is deemed a success for some reason, then it's very hard to sort of say, well, isn't it a bit boring? Isn't it a bit flat? I thought we, this business was had a completely different vibe about it. We're trying to create something new. So I think it's more about the places we go for the reference rather than or the types of reference we look at when we're doing that stuff.
Did that answer it or not? Not really. <laughs> Anyone hey, else? Uh, hey. Hey. Um, I love what you're talking about with the self-referential aspects, and you kind of stole my my next question, which was where where are you looking for um, for inspiration? Where are you where are you finding that? But maybe you can share an anecdote of something recent that you've discovered that's kind of been challenging your uh, rectangle. Something recent that's kind that of pushed I've... you outside of outside of the box or uh, impressed you? Well, there's plenty of companies that look like they're... No, not companies, like outside of design and outside of business. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, as, as for techniques, there's all kinds of things we, that we can do, like even just kicking off a, a meeting in a different environment. Uh, even in, in your own studio, just don't do it in the same place. Go out, do it in the park, do it in all these different places. The New York team just did that, and you kind of get influenced by the world around you. Whereas if we're on our screens and we're looking at the same stuff all the time and, you know, we're all like envious of that latest thing on brand new or we're all envious of that, then you're kind of like stuck. It's like an awful, if you think about it, it's a really awful place to be stuck because mm -hmm. the world's full of so many wonderful, horrible, exasperating, brilliant, brutal, mesmerizing things. And uh, yeah, I just think you just need to throw a wider net. I don't know if I answered your question. No, I couldn't agree more. No. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Hi. Hey. Sorry. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I was just wondering, I think some of those those templates or images, and maybe I'm just thinking about like aspects of UI that are really, we all see it and then we immediately know how I'm like what the call to action is or like how I'm supposed to interact with that. You know, it's like you see the little like hamburger and you know you're supposed to click that and then it's supposed yeah. to expand in some way. Like in some ways that's really helpful because it allows you know, a consumer, a user, what have you, to interact with things more easily. But how do you think you, how does a designer like expand out of that? But, you know, try to come up with new ways. Like what, I don't know if there's something that well, you know, practice how, in your business or. But I think we talk about things like the hamburger, like it's been around for centuries. It hasn't, it's been around like, in, uh, like for a blink. Uh, but we, but we're prepared to see that blink of two years or three years or four years or whatever it is, like it's sacrosanct. But at some point before that existed, somebody created that thing. You know, it's, I know that I know it was, it's been around a long time, but, but you know what I mean? And then there's been the iterations of it and the one where all the menus kind of fold out and then the one where it does the cross and the one lines <laughs> and that's the You know, but they're all iterations and they're all really valuable, but I don't know. I don't know how you push it. I think you've just got to be a bit bloody minded about it. I mean, you, you, you can only push things so far. There's lots of dynamics in a real life project. You know, there's the team dynamic, there's the client team dynamic, there's how those things are interfacing, there's where they are, there's time of day, there's all the personalities, there's the marketing team and all kinds of things. So there's lots of opinions in there. But I think as the creatives on a project, we're, we're the only ones <laughs> that are going to be in a position to change it. We're the only ones kind of got permission to say, Let's go there. If we don't do that, it, it never, we, we don't change it. So I don't know how you do it, but I think if you believe some of the things that I'm talking about and you want to change those dynamics, you've just got to strike out and try and do them and try and sell them in and just be a bit more um, wanting to do that, I suppose. It's hard. I, I understand what you're saying as well. I mean, well, you know, there's lots of things that it's, definitely worth adhering to but I think there's this other thing that's happening is because of that we're kind of getting quite gray about a lot of stuff and and I think it's it's a little odd to be honest a little weird oh my question is almost exactly the same as yours that was my question same answer then um well <laughs> very similar but when you have a couple of big big players um Facebook Apple Google some unique designers who tend to just be the status quo. Right. I know you said you don't know exactly how to break out of that, but can you talk about maybe the balance between giving a seamless user experience where people know what to expect and know how to experience things versus really breaking outside of the box and having some new, some creative designs, things that people haven't seen before, and how that might help or hamper their experience with something completely new? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I definitely think... There is part of what we've got to where we, we kind of know what we're all doing now when it comes to that, that type of experience. And it, whereas I, I remember like 15 years ago, 20 years ago even, 
when a lot of that stuff was new, people were like, really, everything was really experimental. And most of it was pretty awful, if you look at it now. Really hard to navigate. Why the hell would you want to walk through a room to press the play button on a music player? I don't, you wouldn't. So, but it's good that they went through that sort of experimentation. Um, and we're, try, we're perfecting this stuff to such a point now. You know, there's eye tracking stuff and there's milliseconds of data where we're measuring all those times and distances and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. It's, it's definitely hard to argue. But I do think things like imagery, style of icon, style of the hamburger, style of all these elements, I, I think they could be pushed a lot more. Even, even just photography, just take that one thing and think about that in a much more brand oriented way. What's, what's a more appropriate style of photography for our brand? Uh, uh, uh. Definitely, I mean the Benetton things are ultra confusing, right? But it basically, but you get a moment. I, saw, I used to talk to a, one of my co-founders about this as things that resonate or have velocity or something like that, but they're basically objects in the world that buzz with a, a kind of thing that makes you stop in your tracks, think for a minute. You know, it's a bit like when something's hung in a gallery, you're sort of perceiving it in a completely different way to how you might perceive it if it was just at the bottom of your bed in your bedroom. It could be the same object, but the situation changes it. And there's something about m messing with that or trying to work with that to create something that's a, that's a lot more new and a lot more dynamic. I'm not quite sure what the processes are yet. I'm still trying to work them out because I'm just kind of sick of seeing everything the same. So it's kind of new because... You know, as an agency, we've done lots of really interesting things, but we've also done lots of things which do adhere to a lot of these rules and have been great successes and some of the best work that we've done. But I think, as creatives, I think we're the ones that need to keep changing that dynamic and keep pushing for something else. That's why the new technologies coming online are so interesting, because not no touch, <laughs> no screen, that gets really interesting. Like, how are we going to create the new language of how that stuff works? It's, it's super interesting. My hunch will be that it will repeat what the screen stuff looks like in its first couple of generations, and then gradually we'll work out that we don't need to do that, and we can change things in a, in a much better way. I think that's why augmented stuff looks so wrong, because it is like normal screen stuff augmented in our reality, whereas I think making things and making objects that feel different or more contrasting or a bit crazy in scale or just a little more realistic or whatever it is is going to be, get much more interesting. Sorry, I sort of confused myself there. Anyone else? Here? Here, and then we'll go over here. Go here first. I thought it was really inspiring, um, your talk, and to hear, especially to see the differences between the Benetton ads and then some of the current ads. It's almost like a difference between the physical, like, offline or analog world, like having to stage those photographs. There's, those are not stock images. They have to actually like think of it, viscerally make something happen. Um, and I'm wondering, is there a real tension in design now about kind of analog, physical, offline, like the kind of more sensory worlds and how design seems to almost be heading more towards uh, things that are flatter, more online and, and don't have that, that depth of experience or sensorial texture? Yeah, maybe there's definitely been a, a, a move away from things that have texture and shine and all of those things you can see here apple did it you know you know everyone's doing that everyone's stripping the color out of their logos and making flat versions and there's a whole kind of strip down that's happening but at the same time the imagery that's being used is very human very peopley very real you know there's lots of wood and concrete textures and and real life things and part of that might be that that's what people really want to see but there's this awkward rectangle thing that's trying to portray that to us all the time. So there's this weird matchup of those things. Now, before digital was really big, there were more breakout kind of like images of this. I mean, there were more examples. There was old Nike stuff that I was looking at that's just phenomenal. And then you look at Nike things now, they're, they're nice and everything, but it's just like stylized, shiny man running. I don't, or it's the uh, Fitbit sort of man running, but it's Nike now. And, that, you know, there's that sort of... Uh, running around San Francisco kind of look. You know the look? And, um, but Nike are doing that as well. Whereas they used to do like a man running across a piece of elastic that was stretched out and his feet were dipping down and it was like, it was like a piece of art. 
And that's just kind of all gone. It might be because there aren't budgets to do that sort of stuff now. But I always find that argument really riling. It's like it's such an excuse to say there's no budget and therefore we can't. So let's just do it the way we've done it before and we'll get it out the door. And da, da, da. I think we've, you know, we're the creative people on the project. You know, we're, we're the ones that are going to make it a brilliant thing. Hopefully I kind of answered. <laughs> yes, over here. You had your hand up before. Yeah, so I remember not that long ago, it used to be um, a challenge to, you know, you'd find different cultures and different things. If you traveled elsewhere, um, things weren't as Americanized. And it took a while for certain trends to go from one place to another. And it seems like now, I mean, I recently came back from Edinburgh and from France, and everything looks like it's Brooklyn hipster. Yeah, man, and, it's quinoa everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and do you think that that also kind of plays into it, the fact that everything is so connected that a trend hits one place and all of a sudden it's global, um, you know, whether it's clothes, whether it's type, whether it's visuals, um, you know, do we not have any sense of something that is purely like from one area that you can still define? Yeah, for sure. I think that part of that is is real. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I was surprised. I was in Glasgow and it was kind of the same, you know. You get the same kinds of food as here and, you know, there's the same kind of coffee, uh, you know, pop-up coffee stores and, you know, it's, it's kind of everywhere. And it's kind of like, oh, I wasn't expecting to see that. But because we're all able to share all that stuff, it happens all the time. But my question is, does that make it good or does that make it brilliant and important or what, what does that mean or is that just the new because I see it as the the new really ordinary way to drink coffee because it's all like that so I'm just waiting for a, a I want to go in a coffee shop and it not be a wooden counter and concrete and those those metal chairs and there'd be lots of space that no one really uses and it, <laughs> you know I'd, uh, we don't need any more of those we need some coffee shops which are completely different to that I don't know what the difference is but it just annoys me that they they're also similar you know there's little terraniums or all those things with with the succulents in and it's like oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah I'm guilty of it it's too you know I've got mid-century furniture and I've got some of those succulents and you know we've we've all got that stuff but I think I, you know, I really want to, I really want personally and other people just to try and push that envelope a bit more, you know, just, just challenge that. I think it's the challenge. No one feels like they're challenging. It's all getting it done smoothly and making sure the clicks happen and, uh, you know, that's cool, but I don't want to die and think my click tally was pretty fucking high, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, hi. So my question is actually very similar to what you asked. Uh, I don't know if it's a question or, a, or an observation, but I've noticed uh, as people are becoming more and more aware of design being at the forefront, yeah. it becomes very, there's one thing that becomes brilliant and there are so many people that follow like me too's. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to call them copycats, but you yeah, know. It's like, the sheepism. I, that was exactly. My, I, so yeah. it's just, it's an observation. I would love to know what you think about it, that whole is it because of, I don't know, the whole being lazy and the click thing that, oh, let's just do this because it's tried and tested, and no one wants to take that effort to actually dig, dive deeper in understanding what can we do that's more different yeah, I mean, or brilliant or off the edge? I, d I don't know. I suppose that's the question I'm asking, too. I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out what it is and if it's a really... I mean, Maybe I don't even need to worry about it so much, just sort of get on with some stuff. You know, there's plenty of work and plenty of stuff going on. But I, um, I don't know. I think um, hmm. there's definitely sheepism. I mean, I think really creative people don't do that. And I think there's probably 10 times, 100 times, maybe 1,000 times the amount of designers in the world that there was 15 years ago. So there's a more controversial question there, which is who are the creatives, who are the designers, and what are we talking about? Because if it's laying stuff out to be effective, we might as well write a bit of software that can do that. In fact, we, there are bits of software that can do that. So if, if that's the thing that we're doing, is that truly being a creative? Or is it just being a designer in a cool business and feeling good about yourself? Because I think real creativity is very different to... Um, 
sheepism and following trends. And I, I think our, our responsibility at Creative is, is, to, is to challenge that stuff. I think if you really love something, like you really love it, you shouldn't ever emulate it. You should, you should rip it up, burn it, and mix some new paint out of the ashes. That's way more respectful of it than to emulate it. I think if you're emulating something continuously, you're kind of disrespecting it. You're disrespecting all the effort and all the design and all the integrity and all the creativity that went into it. You need to put all that same level of stuff into your own work. So I'm not saying I'm doing that. I'm just saying that <laughs> I, that would be a better thing in the world, I think. Because I've got a job doing design. Yeah. Of which there's lots of them now. There's even more students than there are jobs as well. We're, we're educating a whole generation uh, to believe that they can all be designers. That seems a bit strange to me as well. I don't know why they all want to do that either. So, uh, in addition... <laughs> this feels like it's going to be awkward, I can tell. <laughs> so... In, a, in addition to challenging ourselves, how, do you have any strategies based on your experience about um, also getting your, your clients to take those challenges with you and make um, more emotionally visceral, riskier designs? Um. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we often talk to the client about what's unique about them. Um, what's, you, know, you hear this a lot, so this isn't unique in itself, but what's the story? What's that unique story? Why do you exist as a business? I sometimes say to clients, why should anyone give a shit? It's not that, you know, every, everyone's an ex-Google, everyone's got a great idea, everyone's got all these great things, but what's the very visceral thing? What's the unique thing that people are going to kind of get a connection to? And we spend quite a long time with clients trying to work that out that kind of changes the dynamic how they appreciate the design as you go forwards because they've got that story, that, that mental picture of why they are a challenger. Because everyone says I'm a challenger brand and I'm disrupting the market. And it's like, all right, well, what is that? When did you get that idea? What was the original idea? Why was that idea a thing? I'll uncover that very first seed of the thing. If you can do that, that gets really interesting because it gives you permission to, to go in the direction of that original seed, not go in the direction of... The other, the other brands and the other startups and the other organizations that are in a similar sector, it kind of gives you permission to go a bit somewhere different. So all the design that we do doesn't start with design at all. About a third of the process is kind of understanding the client, understanding the story, looking at everyone else in the market, what's effective, what's not, but what's really true to you as an organization, true to you as a business. And I think that's why when we're drawing logos and creating stuff, it's more about that and it's not about the potential cliches, say you're working with a movie on demand app or something, you know, there's a ton of cliches you can get into there if, if you let yourself play buttons, boring, movie strips, boring, you know, it, it, timelines, you know. And as soon as you do that and you let yourself do it, you're just in with everyone else. There's hundreds of those. But if it's the original idea because someone was pissed off because it didn't work as well or like, the Uber story, like someone couldn't get back from sunset, and it was just like, why can't I get a taxi on New Year's Eve? That's weird. That's a much more interesting story, you know what I mean? So I don't know if I'm answering that, but I think it's about the, mm, the thing before the business, the kind of idea of what it was, what's unique about it, what's unique about it. As some other famous designer says, interrogate the brand until it reveals itself. And then once it does that, once you've got that, then you know how to draw it, then you know how to bring it to life, then you know how to write the messaging. Whereas if you just start designing, I think you lose, you get into cliches really quick. How uh, can you create an environment for designers to actually be less kind of conformist and more brilliant in a way? And from a business side, as a manager, for example, how can you push people to be more brilliant, you know? How can you provide that feedback that will make them understand that they're repeating themselves often and actually maybe other people and help them to get out of the box in a way or out of, the, of their own head? Um, yeah, I think getting out of the studio is really important and, uh, you know, really basic techniques like getting out of the studio. There was another thing we were doing where we've realized that there's people that are very noisy in a group, in a brainstorm, me. There's other people that are very quiet but giving everyone a say 
that's really useful as well because you basically make sure you get all the ideas of the real breadth and depth of the thing. And then just a little bit of an aggravated attitude about design. I think it's okay like to say that's not very good, e even though lots of other people say it's a brilliant thing. You know, have an opinion about it, have a kind of um, version of what you think is good in the world. But you know, our structures quite like a lot of other businesses. I mean, we've got a bit more R&D maybe than other design agencies and we create a bit of time and our, our breadth of offers has always been really broad all the way from making films all the way through to making websites and dealing with brands and creating like brand strategies, product strategies, all that kind of stuff. So there's broadness in that where we've got people that are quite geeky, we've got people that are very design and into the detail, other people that are big thinkers, other people that have done lots of advertising and comms work. So th that mix can really help. Um, you know, put people together that wouldn't normally work with each other. We get, when we get that right, it's really good. But sometimes we get it wrong, you know, we end up the same teams working on the same kind of things. It can get quite stale. So you just have to, A, recognize it, and then just try and shift it around a bit. And we're definitely not doing that perfectly. I'm not saying that we've got this amazing way of working that's sorting all this out. This is the new stuff that I'm thinking about that's kind of interesting to me that's, a, that's, a bit, that's a, you know, got some stuff to get my teeth into, but I haven't sorted it out completely at all. Hey, hey I Jim. know you, don't yeah, I? We, yeah, we met. Uh, great lecture. Hey. But there were really nice observations. Um, I, you know, it got me thinking, I'm curious if this, this sameness that you were talking about, maybe it's happening in music, in science, in politics, like if this is something that's across other, you know, uh, disciplines, or if it's yeah, uh, something to think about. And then I was thinking, you know, when you were showing the example of Benetton, that was from a time when the internet didn't exist, right? And whether the internet can propagate uh, a challenge so fast and so far away. Like I was, you know, taking it outside of design, Tunisia and Egypt have a revolution and then seven other countries have it within two years, right? Yeah. That didn't, that didn't happen so fast before, right? So, um, I wonder if it's fighting against the internet in a way, or what the internet can do. Yeah, and things are kind of the sameness. Yeah, things are a big deal for a fraction of a moment. You know, ten weeks ago is like a year ago in in decade time, sort of thing. So yeah, there's there's definitely all of that, um, and I agree that that's all getting sped up, and and we're seeing all of that, and it, it's it's more difficult to be more effective. But I think the way to break out of that is to try and break out of it and do things that are more challenging and more uh, interesting and, and more creative. But it, it feels like the opposite's happening where it's kind of going the other way and we're all kind of doing everything that's more the same because everything's so the same. It might just be a human, I'm, I'm, I'm not a psychologist or, you know, I'm not very bright actually. But um, it might just be a normal, human reaction to, you know, homogeny would make more homogeny, I, I would presume, until there's a point where it's too much like that. It's a bit like Gaia theory. Is that a real thing? Someone told me about it. Planet has a sun around it, so it gets hold, caught on hold, and when, it, when, it's caught, all the, when, it's caught, when it's cold, all the flowers are black, and then when it's hot, all the flowers are white, and so gradually it goes from a black planet until it's all black and then one white will emerge because the sun's in the right place and then all the white ones. And it's kind of like this theory that the planet can look after itself and it can self-regulate and there's a natural sort of, it's like business, business naturally does that. I mean, if you can get it to go like that but up all the time, that's, that's, that's a good business. So maybe we're just in one of those spikes. So it's gonna be really interesting to see what breaks out of that. Is it gonna be a piece of technology? Or will it be something else? Will it be a social thing? Will it be, like you say, a political thing which completely changes the psyche? What is, what is that going to be? I'm not sure. But I think you're right. I think it's across a lot of stuff. I mean, politics, for sure, everything's becoming in the middle, right? It's sort of left, left middle, right middle. And uh, that's true here, I think. Uh, that's, sort of, that's true in the UK. You can see that all the time. But because it's getting in the middle, then you get these like very right-wing breakouts and very left-wing breaks at breakouts. And, the, you know, I presume if everything will go like that and then everyone gets sort of bored of that and all go into the middle again. And then we'll, you know, and I'll just keep doing that. So maybe it's just a natural thing.
I'm just annoyed that it all looks the same, that's all. <laughs> um, great talk. I, I really appreciate all the uh, inspiration. Um, so what I, I kind of want to just make a statement and not really ask oh, a cool. question. Yeah, good. Um, I'll go over here. Basically, <laughs> uh, in looking at where we are, we have to sort of examine where we've come from. Right. And um, what your sort of question is, where's the risk? And who's who's taking those risks and I feel like uh, with the rise of the Apple design aesthetic is sort of what led us in this direction because they showed the world that design strict design aesthetic can make money so I suppose the real question here is who's going to take the risk to break out of that in order to prove to the businesses who are making the decisions of where to spend their money um, to push things in the, the other direction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, would Benetton do well if it had ads that challenging now? That's the interesting question. Or is the psyche in us as, as culture so different that we wouldn't react to it in the same way that we did then? Or what's the new version of that now? And you're right, who's going to pay for it? Who's going to take that risk? Someone will, and it will happen. I mean, Apple did. That's, that's what they did, and they changed that dynamic. But it strikes me that someone's got to... I'm waiting for, like, really gritty ads and crazy things and, and stuff that doesn't quite make sense that hooks me in and makes me want to find out more, and there doesn't seem to be that way of communicating to us anymore. It's sort of all on a plate and perfect. But we seem to be admiring that and putting it on a pedestal and saying that's, that's a beautiful, brilliant thing. Apple are really good. I, I mean, they're a wonderful thing. I haven't got a bad thing to say about them. I think there's, there's well, not very often. But there's, you know, it, it, it's an amazing thing they've done. But there's something in the emulation in that which is a bit dull. You know, they're breaking out every now and then, pushing it forward and pushing it forward, and it gets emulated and emulated and emulated. But someone's going to have to break out of that and do it in a different way. We'll all get bored of it at some point. Hey, yeah, so thanks for your talk tonight. I wanted to, uh, to dive a little deeper on the, the undulations you were speaking of a second ago. Right. And, um, you know, if we're, if we're on one side of the cycle now, um, I guess I was curious about the other side of the cycle. Specifically, like, we're all consumers of design every day. And I wonder what it would be like as consumers to just constantly be confronted by very emotionally arresting images. Um, you know, where every, every time someone is, is sort of advertising a sweater, I, I have to see it, the equivalent of a baby fresh from the womb. Like what, what that would actually be like to live in. Uh, is that, is yeah, that the yeah. ideal? <laughs> Imagine, that'd be brilliant. This is kind of a loaded question. I, then I'd be up uh, here no, going, I, I, I'm why not, can't uh, we have a nice sunset with, <laughs> you know, someone with shades going, whoa, I've got a coffee and it's really easy to get in this taxi. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's uh, the undulation. I think I was trying to, I don't know if that's a real thing. I think. Right. I don't think there's much chance that every brand suddenly going to be as breakout. I mean, Benetton was extremely breakout mm -hmm. when they were doing that stuff. But stuff was more generally able to do that. There was more attitude across the board in advertising and comms and brands having strong brands that all felt like they were pulling in all kinds of different directions. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it would be, it would be just as infuriating, I suppose. What does that mean, though? Does that mean that somewhere in the middle is kind of good? I mean, I don't mind everyone being on repeat and doing the same thing, but occasionally I want someone not to. You know, I only need it like once a month or something, something to just make me go, holy shit, they just did that. That's mental. You know, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's just me being selfish. I just need like um, more extreme stimulation or something. I don't know. Maybe I should try and find that another way. Hopefully only a couple of people tonight will take away the message and not everyone. It could be too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just try it. Just try it. Just try and do something a bit different. Maybe you all are. I don't know. Let's do two more questions. Okay, great. And then great. we'll switch over to the shout-out section. So if you haven't done shout-outs before, it's your chance to just promote yourself or your ideas or something else, but you do have to come off the stage. So last two questions. Anyone in, in the audience? There's one over here. Ah. <laughs> Down here. Down there. All right. How's it done? Hi. Um, so. Oh, have you made notes? Yes. Uh, okay. 
Uh, so the Benetton ads are really going for an emotional response. And I think there is in today's world, like, the same thing happening. But it's clickbait. Like, the woman peeling off her skin. Right, right, right. And uh, you wouldn't believe this. I feel like that is the equivalent in today's world. And do you think that brands in today's world are afraid of looking like clickbait if they go for that shock value? Is that why they're being so polished? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think there are things out there that are doing some of that dynamic, but it still seems more sanitized to me for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Um, but but are, are brands afraid? I'm not even sure they're thinking necessarily to try and be so breakout because it's... I, th I think it's... Maybe it's because there's sort of more, more at stake now, less reason to put your hopes in the arms of the advertising agency that are going to do something dynamic. But, you know, we, we, we use Apple as an example, but they, they did that. You know, they were challenger and breakout and, you know, that famous ad in 1984 and it didn't really look like everything else. It was very challenging and those kinds of things. So, and when a brand does do that, it can make a leap much bigger than just the leap you do by getting everything really good and, and really perfect and working really well. I think you then got to do something big and dynamic. And I think if you can do that and you get it right, it's riskier for sure. It's like putting all, all your money on, on red or, or whatever, you know. It's definitely riskier. But if it's true, I think it's less risky. I think if you're just doing it to be a uh, sensationalist, it's probably not going to work. But if, if there's something about your brand which suits that, I think it resonates with, with, with people in a, in a better way. Maybe I answered that. Last one. Hey, Jim. Hey, man. Uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on usability and experiences where you need to return to something again and again? Uh, sort of ties into a lot of the questions that were asked already tonight. But in context of specifically the Benetton example, you showed uh, a billboard advertisement yeah. in the 90s and then uh, a modern day uh, splash page on the internet where you're supposed to come to it understand what you're supposed to do, be able to interact with these elements and buy something. That's, that's the goal of the page, is, is to make a transaction. So I'm curious, uh, maybe in the work that you do or your experience um, you know, throughout your career, how have you seen the evolution of usability become um, you know, something that's, that's more important than the flash? Like Liz was just saying, the like, shock factor, that clickbait. How has that evolved over time? Yeah, I mean, of course it's really important, particularly with sites and services and software and products that you're going back to all the time and using. There's a familiarity to that that's, that's really, really important. But, and, well, I think that thing I showed is actually a, an ad. I don't, I'm not sure it's a, a page, actually, but I can, I can check that out. I know there was an ad that ran with it, billboard ad, that was pretty much the same. That's not that different. Um, um, but I think, yeah, usability and, the, and the, the, the ease of that and the how effective that is and making sure that that's, that's right, I think it's all, it's had a massive effect on, on that kind of work. But I still think, and that's cool. I'm not, see, I'm, not, I'm not actually saying that that's bad, but I think that, that's cause sort of making sure brochures work and making sure the product works and all those sorts of things. But I think brands also have to do other things. And what I find disappointing is when they do make an ad, when they do make a billboard, when they do make a TV ad, it feels like it's being made the same way as they made that usability thing. And I wonder if they could break that stuff out more, that would give them more permission to sort of change things up a bit. But it is, it is a delicate thing. It's not as easy as, you know, those Benton things for sure are just ads, so they work in a particular way. I think I was more getting at, and there's lots of intricacy in that, and there's lots of things I was saying that just doesn't quite add up, particularly from a usability standpoint. But I still think there's a responsibility as creatives to just try and push that dynamic wherever we can. But if you're responsible for purely the usability of something and how it's working, I don't recommend that you suddenly put, you know, a newborn baby in the middle of the, uh, the user experience. Um, but somewhere in the brand, <laughs> there might be a way of being more expressive that's going to kind of force things through. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, please give a round of applause for Jim.